Um, today's presentation is Mike Full. He is here to talk about fossils of the Willamette Valley, and he has brought some of his collection to share with us. So please welcome Mike. New electronics here. I hate electronics. I hate technology. Hi, folks. Um, I'm back. I think I was here about 10 years ago, if, uh, if, if uh, my memory serves me, and it's been going a lot lately. But we've been busy in the last 10 years, so I got invited back. Thank you very much. And I've got to tell you, more than anything else, my wife thanks you. I am now retired, and my wife finds that to be somewhat of a trial. Apparently, she thinks that me being retired is one of the uh, one of the harder things in life. Bless her heart. Um, anybody here from the South? Come on, you can't all be Yankees, right? Okay, yeah. If you're from the South, you, you're going to know that anytime you say, "Well, bless her heart," that the next thing that you're going to hear out of your mouth is like a stab in the back from that. So when some other folks do that, but my wife, bless her heart, seems to think that. Uh, that me being retired is a trial for her that she has to keep tabs on me all the time, like, uh, oh, don't play with that, you'll break it. Um, put your pants on if you're going to answer the door. <laughs> See, I told you if you played with that, you'd break it. So when I get to come out here and talk to folks about the fossils that we find here in the Melanic Valley, she refers to that as being able to show the folks old bones that are almost as old as I am. Now, mean or woman you've never seen in your entire life. And Susan and Dorothy can both tell you that. Because I know she's mean to me, isn't she, Dorothy? Isn't she, Dorothy? She's mean to me. That's fine. So, today, if I got the... Nope, I didn't. Ha ha! Now I've got it figured out. No, no worries now, Mom. Okay, today we're going to go to the Willamette Valley Pleistocene Project. We used to be the McMinnville Pleistocene Project. Last time I was here, I think we were the Yamhill River Pleistocene Project. Now we're the Willamette River, or the Willamette Valley Pleistocene Project. That's because more and more folks got it, have gotten um, involved in the program, and little by little, we just kind of expanded our horizons. I'm not going to go outside of the Willamette Valley, though, because I've got too much going on right now. What we do, though, is we explore the late Pleistocene and the early Holocene of the Willamette Valley in northwestern Oregon. We're composed of local volunteers and resources. We don't have we don't have any money, so I can't give you a treasurer's report. But we're avocational paleontologists, landowners, uh, government work, uh, gov and local government working alongside trained professionals and museum staff. And our goal is to discover, study, preserve our prehistoric past. Uh, we work with Oregon State University, University of Oregon. We've been very involved with Linfield College lately. And more and more and more, we are working with students around the valley. I've got uh, six days this month that I'll be giving presentations to uh, middle school and elementary school children. And, and uh, we also do a class for Linfield College every year. And we facilitate uh, field trips to some of the various excavations and include the students there. The students that we've, uh, we've included have been as young as five and as old as 85. So if you have an interest in uh, prehistory and fossils, we're at www.willamettevalleypleistocene.com or when you get on your computer, you just type in something like McMinnville Fossil, Willamette Valley Fossil, anything along those lines because there just aren't, aren't that many of us really. So fossils, this is what everybody thinks about when, uh, you suppose we could knock a light down or two back here, it might be a little easier for some of the folks to see the, the slides that we've got. Perfect, thank you. Okay, this is what everybody thinks about when we're thinking about fossils, right? The first thing that goes through somebody's mind is we're gonna see some fossils out here, and the word is what? Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs, right? Dinosaur, no dinosaurs. No dinosaurs. The only reason you think dinosaurs would think fossils is because a group of Tyrannosaurus got together about 63 million years ago and they hired a really, really good PR agent. Okay, and he started talking nothing but dinosaurs and Tyrannosaurs and all that. And they got real officious and all of a sudden, right out of the sky, comes this comet and wipes them all out. Now, that's the truth and you heard it from me. So, here's Yamhill County during the time of the dinosaurs. Okay, we were an ocean. 
there wasn't much going on. There were a few ichthyosaurs swimming around, but uh, they're not really dinosaurs. Uh, there was, a, there was a, a lot of stuff going on under the ocean, and if you go over to the coast, where the banks are eroded, you'll find some really old fossil clam shells and things like that. Not really very exciting. So, Yamhill County, if you want to look at some really cool stuff, you got to come to the geologic timeline of the Cenozoic. The Cenozoic is the age of the mammals. That's when we took over, basically. Uh, we took over about 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs had a really bad day. And here in Oregon, if you're standing out on your lawn and you dig straight down, sooner or later you might be really lucky to find a fossil. A little harder to find one than that because something doesn't die virtually everywhere. But what you find is that about every, after you've gone through the topsoil, about every foot you go down in the compacted medium around here, you're traveling back in time about a thousand years. So I can look out my back door and if I stand in my backyard, I'm at the present day, and if I start down the bank toward the river, I'm one of the lucky guys I look out onto the Amhill River. When I get to the bottom of the Amhill River and stand on that compacted blue clay down there, I'm standing on compacted blue clay, which is decomposed volcanic ash from the boring ash flows that ended about 50,000 years ago. And I know that because I had to take some classes in uh, college so I could talk to folks like you. And my mentor has been Bill Orr, who wrote the book on such things. And he says those are the uh, last of the boring ash flows out of the Portland area. Not that they were boring, but because they came out of the boring area. And volcanic ash decomposes into blue clay, the type of blue clay you see around here. If you're looking at blue clay, you might be looking at that. You might be looking at, say, the Mazama ash fall, which was about 6,000 years ago, 6,500 years ago, something like that. And it's also decomposed into blue clay. So what we're looking at is kind of a blink of an eye geologically. It's, it's pretty recent stuff. It's all the way up there at the top. Now, the Holocene, that's kind of an artificial timeline that we created to say everything after the Ice Ages. The last Ice Ages ended about 10,000 years ago. That's the last ones that we know about. Of course, there might be another one around the corner coming here. But people live in the present, in the moment. And 50,000 years ago seems to be a long time to people. But geologically, it's the blink of an eye. What we have in the valley here is a beautiful compilation of the strata from about 50,000 years ago in the bottom of the river right on up to the present day. And what we find in that is the bones that we can radiocarbon date. The McMinnville Mammoth and the McMinnville Bison 1 that are being excavated right here and right here in the city limits of McMinnville, they date back to in excess of 51,700 years. Just over that, there's another layer that we found more bison bones in, McMinnville Bison 2. He's about 32,000 years old. On up the scale, the McMinnville Sloth, which was found uh, right off Joe Dancer Park, as a matter of fact, um, he dates to about 16,600 years old. And the Gilpin Creek Mammoth, do any of you folks remember, oh gosh, it's been almost probably 15, 16 years ago now, something like that. Uh, a couple of kids found a mammoth tooth in a creek in McMinnville. They went down to the Tonight Show. Joe, uh, 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 Jay Leno interviewed him about uh, the McMinnville, the uh, mammoth find in McMinnville. That was on Gilpin Creek, and that's about uh, 12,800 years ago. Uh, right in there was when the Bretsch floods were coming through. And uh, everybody, you know what the Bretsch floods are? The Great Ice Age floods, the Missoula floods. Everybody's kind of heard about them. Well, when you're talking about them in the Willamette Valley, you're not talking about this rushing wall of water 120 feet high moving at 60 miles an hour. That was up in the gorge. That was up in the, in, uh, along the Columbia. When it came rushing down the Columbia and hit that narrow chokehold spot near Portland, it washed up the Willamette Valley. When it washed up the Willamette Valley, it wasn't this huge wall of water. It was basically water that was backing up. So if you're a herd of mammoths, standing around eating grass, and the next day you might look down and notice that you're knee deep in water. So you'd move up the hill a ways. And the next day you'd be knee deep in water, so you'd move up the hill a ways, and the next day you'd be knee deep in water. When the water finally stopped rising, after a while it receded, and as it went back down the hill, you moved on back down the hill and repopulated the area. So it, it was no catastrophic 
huge, terrible flood in here. What we see for the floods in the, in the Willamette Valley and around McMinnville is this nice, fertile soil that we can grow wheat and grass and corn and wine in, or grapes for wine in. So well, the Ice Ages were really kind of cool for us. It, it filled the valley with this, with this great soil that we all enjoy. That's, in a heartbeat, the geologic timeline. So what do we have around here? The Ice Age megafauna of Yamhill County. Willamette Valley was an Ice Age Serengeti. This was a cool area. A lot of the stuff that we find out here, and not the stuff I've got on the table out here, because if I showed you a bunch of, uh, oh, deer bones and elk bones and beaver bones and muskrat bones and stuff like that, they would look just like beaver bones and muskrat bones and elk bones and deer bones of today. They would just be 50,000 years older. So, this, so the stuff that I brought up here for you to look at is some of the animals that have gone extinct. For hundreds of thousands of years, we had herds of these really exotic animals up and down the valley. We had herds of bison that, that would migrate up and down the Willamette Valley. We had herds of horses that would go up and down the Willamette Valley. All these really cool stuff along with sloths, a couple of different kinds of camel, uh, two different kinds of elephant, were right here in Yamhill County. And what we do is go out, find these, uh, these fossils, find people that have found these fossils, hopefully use them as resources, and collect them. Everything that we collect stays in the public domain. We don't collect it for, gee, Mike Full wants to have a collection of fossils in his house. These are all in a database that can be found online. It's open to researchers. We've had uh, two master's theses address our fossil database so far. All of this information will stay in the public domain, will stay live, and when I'm finished collecting down there, it's going to go to a proper educational institution. Uh, right now, Linfield College is expressing a little bit of interest in it. You have always expressed a lot of interest in it. See, Kowalikin wants it very badly. So it's going to stay in the public domain. We're not collecting for ourselves. And our volunteers know that before they, before they go out in the boat. And I tell folks when they go out in the boat with me, we're going to go out in the river. We're going to look for fossils. You might find the coolest, neatest, rarest, most valuable fossil in the world. I will take your picture with it. I will give you all the credit for it. I will write you up in the website. You can come visit it anytime you want to because at the end of the day, I'm going to take it away from you. And the reason for that is we've got some fossils. Like we have a, 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 a pelvis out of a mastodon that's about this big. And right now, it's in three different pieces that have been reassembled into one because we found three pieces over the period of a decade scuba diving the bottom of the river and we're able to piece them back together. If you went down the river with me, found something really cool and got to take it home with you, we'd never know that it fits something else. We'd lose the scientific value of it. We'd lose the provenience and the scientific information behind that. So when we collect something, we take a picture of it in place, we GPS it exactly in place, we describe it, we do all of our own preservation, restoration, uh, we assign a, an ascension number to it, and we put it into a database that, uh, that can be accessed by researchers. So that's the game we play now that I'm uh, retired and keeping my retained wife too much. Today, we're going to take a trip into the past and get a glimpse of some of the wondrous beasts that once inhabited the, the county. And we're going to do that by looking at their fossil remains. We'll take a look at the most recent discoveries because, like I said, I was here about, was anybody here when I was here last? Oh, I got a few. Good enough. I will call you my fans, okay? <laughs> this is the number one table over here. This is my fan yeah. table. Okay. Uh, we'll look at some of the more recent ones that you guys haven't gotten to see and hear about yet. And then we're going to take a look at some of the ongoing uh, projects, the educational projects, because, like I said, more and more we're getting involved with uh, students in the area, and a lot of what we do is, uh, is through the slave labor of the children that I managed to drag down the river in Fort to have fun. Columbia Mammoth. This is our signature animal here. This is the McMinnville Mammoth. We have found fossil remains of many mammoths along the Amhill River, probably a dozen or more, um, since we've started looking, ranging from juveniles all the way up to very large adults. The Columbia Mammoth stood over 12 feet high. He was the largest elephant species that ever lived, 
and it's believed to have gone extinct about 12,500 years ago. They have found some fossils in pockets that may have actually um, escaped the great extinction that may have lasted until about 7,000 years ago. And in fact, mammoths, the woolly mammoth, a, uh, a shorter, dumpier, ugly cousin of the great Columbia mammoth. Everybody's heard of the woolly mammoth, right? Okay, who's heard of the Columbia mammoth? Yep, right? Again, I'm telling you, it's the PR agent that makes all the difference in the world. You get a good PR agent, everybody loves you. Sir? The same uh, species that they just uh, found over at uh, OSU. At OSU? That was a, I was, I, I was there. That was the first one they called and went down there. And I was there when the guy that did all the press conferences said, ha, we have a mastodon here. And I said, oh, no, sir, you have a mammoth here. How do you know that? Because of the dimensions of the femur that you see here, a mastodon with a short, slender, wider, here, fatter, here. And he said, thank you very much. And walked right over to the news cams and said, I have determined that this was a Columbia mammoth. <laughs> Scientists. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, that was, that was a Columbia mammoth. And what we had around here were Columbia mammoths. A woolly mammoth that gets all the attention in the media, he was kind of shorter, dumpier. He was kind of hairy looking. Um, I don't know. Maybe he was a genetic throwback or something. But the cool thing about the, the, the woolly mammoth, Mammothus primogenus instead of Mammothus columbi, the woolly mammoth actually survived the Great Extinction. They survived the Great Extinction by downsizing because when the Ice Ages ended, the ocean came up and trapped some mammoths on an island off of the Russian coast called Wrangell Island, right off of Siberia. And the mammoths got to be about this tall. They downsized just like horses in the Channel Islands, Shetland horses became Shetland ponies because they were trapped on an island and had to become smaller because of the limited resources. Well, mammoths did the same thing. And there they were on this island called Wrangell Island in the Bering Sea, right off the coast of Siberia, living a happy life until some Siberian seal hunters came along about 4,000 years ago. And they were out looking for, of course, seal oil and, and whale blubber because that's the sort of thing they Anybody here eat muck tuck, see, um, whale, oil, uh, whale blubber? Nobody's eating muck tuck? You, yeah. Nasty, isn't it? Nasty. Have you tried, have you tried uh, seal oil? No. It's worse. <laughs> it's worse, okay? Yeah. So I can't really blame it on the Siberians because if I was out there looking for seal oil and muck tuck to eat and I came across an island that had something as tasty looking as this on it, I'd eat every last one of them too before I ever went back and had another uh, whale burger. <laughs> so 4,000 years ago, uh, bam, mammoths become extinct through human overpredation. But think about it, 4,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, they were making the pyramids in Giza. This is into historic times. We know all about the pyramids in Giza because they wrote about them. This is historic times that we're talking about. Mammoths made it into them. They, they claim this close to beating extinction. This close. Everybody has a bad day once in a while. We find a lot of these remains. They're one of the most common of the remains we find on the, in the Willamette Valley. Not because they were the commonest of animals. The commonest of animals, of course, would have been little birds, salamanders, frogs, uh, mice, rats, beaver, things like that. But all of those animals have much smaller, much tinier, much more fragile bones. And when you wear out of the bank and go tumbling down the river uh, within a season or two, you're nothing more than silt and mud. You get ground to pieces, whereas a mammoth bone can be so big that even if it gets ground up into tiny, tiny little pieces, those tiny, tiny little pieces are still mega cool looking things. You can actually see the gravel in this bone here that was uh, part of the gravel stone matrix that it, was, that it was in. So we find a lot of mammoths because mammoths were common and mammoths were big. And the bigger and more robust the animal, the more, and the more common it is, the more of your fossils we're going to find. The Columbian mammoth, all over McMinnville, we know that there were babies here because we have found baby mammoth teeth. We know there were giant mammoths here because we have found a tooth stub or a, a tusk stub of a large bull mammoth that probably would have been 12 to 14 foot long if we had found the entire tusk. It's this big at the base. Uh, fairly common and they apparently had a stable community and lived here probably year round. This is a single tooth 
from a Colombian mammoth. That's off of an adult. And there's a baby mammoth tooth. Same animal. A lot of difference. We found them both right here in the Yamhill River. This was no more than three miles from where you're standing right now. We came up with this little beast here. The American Mastodon. The American Mastodon is an ugly elephant. His sloped forehead, he was a little bit stubbier, a little bit heavier. But the biggest difference between a mammoth and a mastodon is several million years ago, they had a common ancestor. And as they diverged, and as they went their separate ways, mastodons ended up being in a more, uh, a more brushy or woodland or hilly environment and ate more and more and more trees, roots, twigs, that sort of thing that the common ancestor ate than the, than the mammoth did. The mammoth start, went out onto the plains and started eating more and more and more grasses. So over the years, they evolved into different, slightly different looking animals, and the biggest difference is their teeth. A mammoth has a big grinding surface on their teeth, and they grind grasses up like this because grasses are high in silicon, and if you don't grind them up, you can't get the nutrients out of them. If you can't get the nutrients out of them, you starve to death. You can eat as much as you want, but you'll still starve to death. That happens to horses today, right? When a horse gets real old, what do you do? Float his teeth and then it's good to go again. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't trust floating a mammoth's teeth. They might be a little growly about it. <laughs> but mastodons had these big bunadot teeth that allowed them to strip twigs, bark, that sort of thing, and mammoths had nice flat teeth. We've got a mammoth tooth up here and a mastodon tooth. You can certainly look at them. We've got some fossils up here. Come up, look at them, and ask any questions, because I'll hang around as long as you guys have questions today. A mastodon. Um, Hairy little beast, that's Carlton. I'm pretty sure there were mastodons in Carlton because we found a mastodon tooth just about two miles away from that, uh, um, that signpost right there. They were in the area, we don't find mammoths and mastodons, uh, we don't find mastodons as commonly as we find mammoths. That may be because mastodons did not live in herds like we know that mammoths did. It may be because Mastodons usually lived in the brushlands, which would have been a little bit higher. And if you die in the hills, the chances that you're going to be fossilized are much less than the chances that you will be fossilized if you die down in the grasslands, where you can fall into a bog hole, be covered up, not be trampled, and not rot away. So it might be it might be just a combination of those two things. But we don't find quite as many mam or mastodons as we find mammoths in the area. This is a baby mammoth tooth, and that's off the North Yam Hill River, just a couple of miles from that, uh, the last signpost on it. The cool thing about this particular baby mammoth tooth here is that uh, this guy and I were down looking for fossils on the river, and we were finding nothing. And I turned him around and I said, Richard, what we need here is, is a quest for the day. He looked at me kind of like, you're being stupid again, right? He does that a lot. Uh, it's a, probably a genetic defect on his part. And I said, look, we need something to be looking for. And today, today only, just today, we're going to find a mastodon tooth. And he said, oh, okay, all right, go. You mean like this one? And I laughed at him because I thought he was screwing around with me. And I said, yeah, yeah, ha, ha, and he said, isn't it one? And I turned and looked at him, he's holding up this baby man. I said, oh, my God, everything I could have said, like 30 seconds afterwards, he's got this in his hand. So a week later, my buddy Marvin and I are down the Yam Hill, the South Yam Hill River, and we're looking for fossils. And we pulled up this one bank, and I got the boat out, and I'm going to scoop the bank up onto the bar here. But before I did that, I looked at him and said, Marvin, You'll never believe what happened last week in when Richard and I were down there, and I related this story to him. And he said, how interesting, or something like that. He looked at me like I was crazy. That's probably a genetic defect on his part. And I looked at him and said, what we need today is a quest, just like that one. Marvin, today we're going to find a mammoth tooth. And he said, okay. And he turned around to look for the mammoth tooth, and I grabbed the boat, 
to pull it up onto the shore so I could look for mammoth teeth and I looked between my feet and there was this mammoth tooth right here. So I brought it along so I could tell you that story today. And there it was. So I hope you know what we're going to be doing on the river this summer when we go down there. Marvin, it's a quest. We're going to find a giant short-faced bear articulated entire skeleton. <laughs> this gal here is from the North America Research Group and all day long that's Richard up there again and myself and her had been down the river looking for fossils and I found a little piece of a fossil and then Richard found a little piece of a fossil and I found a little piece of a fossil and I found another little piece of a fossil and another little piece of a fossil and then Richard found a little artifact and all this time, Deborah there is getting her nose out of joint because we're finding all this stuff and she's not, she's getting real quiet in the boat. And then she pulls this up out of the river. That's an entire mastodon rib there. It's almost four feet long. You can see she no longer looks sad. <laughs> <laughs> Those things are still down there. This was, uh, this, was, this was last year and large fossils are still there to be found. The American bison, the ancient bison, these are cool beasts out here. Just, anybody know what this is a fossil of? I'll give you a hint. <laughs> these things were ginormous. They have an entire um, skeleton of one that they dug out of a bog on the high school grounds in Woodburn. That's part of our project, is the Willamette Valley Pleistocene Project, is the Woodburn High School project down there, and David Ellingson, the high school teacher down there, has assembled this entire thing. I got to put the skull back together on it. It's, it's like this wide. It's ginormous. And if you stand next to it, just you, has anybody here been near a real buffalo? Yeah, quite a few people. They're this tall, aren't they? You can walk up to him, look over the back of him. A real big bull, he might be up in like this. Top of the hump on a, on a bison antiquus, just over eight feet tall on the one we call the big boy. I'm telling you, there'd be some ribs to eat on that. <laughs> That'd be some tasty eating. It'd have to be. They were a huge beast, and they were real common here in the Willamette Valley. We've gotten uh, more bison fossils than probably any... You know how the traffic is in uh, Dundee nowadays. <laughs> Think what it'd be if you had to wait for a herd of them to walk past you. I'm pretty sure that they wouldn't be too intimidated by one of these little hybrid cars that run up and down the road right now. <laughs> Eat that thing like they look very much like a buffalo, but a buffalo on steroids. They were big, and we've got one partial horn core off of one. It may have been even larger. We may have the very first bison latifrons, that is giant forest bison, to be discovered in Oregon. We're waiting information back from uh, University of Idaho on that to see if our horn core measures up to their, uh, their standards. A couple of 4-H kids. I've got uh, three different crews that go down the river with me and I forced them to uh, run around in the river and look for fossils out there. Came up with this one just uh, that last, just the year before last. They didn't get down last summer on it. And uh, you can see they were pretty happy kids about finding that. Uh, Joni and I have known each other since college. She comes down the river with us every year, does some scuba diving with us, and that's an absolutely gorgeous bison molar. And if you notice all of these pictures out here, generally somebody acts like they're really excited and smiling when they find one of these fossils. It's kind of cool. To me, I'd rather find one of these than a gold nugget down there on the river. These have just got history. You can, you can hold it in your hand and you can just feel the history in these things. It's amazing. I love, love that old river and looking for the stuff in it. Now the horse, we find a lot of horse bones down on the river. And you might think that you expect this, except the horse bones that we're finding are 16,000, 18,000, 20,000 years old. And as we all know, there weren't any horses in North America. And horses actually evolved in North America. They were these little tiny four-toed things, and then they were these little tiny three-toed things, and then there were these little tiny two-toed things, and then there were these little tiny one-toed things that actually looked kind of like a horse. They originated here in North America, they evolved in North America, but 
they migrated, and they migrated across the Bering Sea land bridge into Asia, and they spread all the way across the world. And then, at the end of the Ice Ages, they all died out. Here in the Willamette Valley, we've got what are probably... Now, the horses are cool. Anybody here that does not like horses, if, if there is, don't put your hand up, because the rest of the folks here will probably set up on you and beat you. Uh, everybody loves horses. It's something in human nature to love horses. So everybody that finds a horse, every one of these scientists that finds a horse, they look at that horse and say, look, I found a species of horse. We will call it Equus Michael Fulli. And they have like 50 species of horses in North America. Well, there's probably three. It's just that everybody likes to name horses after themselves because everybody loves horses. We had one horse that was very much like modern horse. Uh, um, that would have been that would have been Equus, uh, what Equus ferus, the the wild horse. And there was another one that was a subgenus of the horse, subgenus Asinus, and that would have been best called the American onager, the American zebra, the American ass. No, wait, that's me. Um, it would have been one of it would have been along one of those. It would have looked probably something like a zebra. So we know that because of the teeth. Cool thing is, if you find a fossil tooth, you basically got the animal. If I tell you I've got a 1967 Mustang in my garage at home, and you come over to visit me, you're going to expect to see a 1967 Mustang, all of it, there in my garage. But if I say, I've got a Equus ferris in my collection, and you show up at my house, you're going to be satisfied to see a single piece, a demonstrative diagnostic piece, like a tooth. And if you've got a tooth, you've got the whole thing. So you'll hear, you'll hear me talking about, oh, I found 13 mammoths on the Yamhill River. I found 22 mammoths on the Yamhill River. Then I found the whole thing. It means I found a distinct piece of a different mammoth. I know it's different because of the size of the bone, the size of the tooth, the location it was found. Uh, the radiocarbon dating on it because no mammoth lives to be 3,000 years old, so it's got to be a different one. So, find the tooth, you found the animal, and we found two distinctly different type of horse tooth. We got one that's obviously equus, and we got one that uh, the um, Page Museum, which is the La Brea Tar Pits, said is an oninger tooth. And if the La Brea Tar Pits says it's an oninger tooth, that's good enough for me, folks, because they're smarter than I am. We've got them all up and down. The one on the right, he's my impression of what an oninger would look like. He's kind of a cute little fellow, about half the size of the other horse bones we found. We know that because we have found cannon bones for both of them. This would be a large horse cannon bone. We've got one which the epiphysy is just as well ossified, indicating it's an adult animal, and it's about one-third this size. So one of them was big, one of them was small, one of them had real simple teeth, that looked much like an oninger, one of them had uh, real big teeth, which is like a horse tooth. So we can say, ha, we have a 26,000-year-old horse. And that mucky little nasty thing that both of the young ladies are pointing at there, cleaned up very nicely to be this bone right here, which Dr. Christopher Shaw of the Page Museum took one look at and said, huh, that's a, that's a really nice horse bone that you have there. Cool. And again, if Page Museum says it, that's good enough for me. They're, they're smarter than I am. And this is a, met that's a cannon bone, a metacarpal from a horse fossil. That would be this one right here. And the guy I was bragging about earlier, Dave Ellingson, the high school teacher from uh, Woodburn, that is him. I drag him down on the Yam Hill River every year. We go scuba diving. I try to drown him out of sheer jealousy. But uh, so far, he's, he has escaped every effort on my part. Camelids. I call them camelids because like the horse, camels evolved right here in North America. They're ours. And they became camelids, which are camels and yamas. And camelids migrated north, and camelids migrated south. In the south, they, they became yamas, acunas, guanacos, and alpacas. And in the north, they spread across Asia and into Africa, and they became the two species of uh, 
camels, uh, what is it, uh, dromedary and, uh, what's the other one? There you go. One hump or two, okay? Just to make it easy, one hump, one hump or two. But they were ours originally, and at the end of the Ice Age, here they died out. We don't have very many of them. As far as I know, I know of four fossils you know, that have been found west of the Cascades in Oregon that are, uh, that have been identified for sure as being camel. One of them was in some gravel deposits in Portland. Uh, one of them is a toe bone uh, out of Woodburn. And we have a tooth of a hemiochium macrocephala, which is the large-headed yama, and a tooth of uh, Camelops hesternus, which is the giant ice age camel. And they both came from right here in the Amhill River, just a few miles from here. So the Amhill River has proven to be an outstanding source of uh, fossils that we know should be here. We just haven't found them yet. Uh, Camelops here, he probably looked an awful lot like the camel of today. His bones look almost indistinguishable from the camel of today, except, of course, he was bigger. Um, and he may not have had the hump. That might have been something that, uh, that they evolved after they had evolved, uh, after they had migrated across the Bering Sea land bridge. But he would have been easily the size of a plow horse. He was, was a big beastie. Old identity. We had this uh, fossil in our collection for almost 12 years before Christopher Shaw from the Page Museum was down visiting us, or up visiting us, and he took one look at it and he said, you've got this one misidentified, you better uh, open up a new page in your book. That one's Camelops hesternus, that's not a bison. Bison and camel teeth look very much alike, and without an awful lot of uh, familiarity with them, you're gonna have a hard time telling one from another. And almost everybody that comes to me with a fossil that they found off of the Anthill River and the Willamette River proudly shows it to be a camel tooth. And when I tell them, no, that's a bison tooth on it, it's, it's terribly almost cry. Uh, evidently, camels have a better publicity agent than bison do. <laughs> Myself, I think bison's cooler than camel, but to each their own. We've got them both here on the, uh, on the Anthill River. This is a tooth of an extinct large head yama, that is, as far as I know, the only uh, hemiochnia macrocephala tooth that has been found uh, west of the Cascades in Oregon, and again, right here on the Anthill River, just a few miles from here. On to something that's even cooler than all of them, the Harlan's ground sloth. The Harlan's ground sloth was this, everybody knows what a sloth is, right? You're not very smart, and you're not very fast. So what do you do if you've got two strikes against you like that and there's something like the uh, giant short-faced bear out there or or the saber-toothed cat out there or the dire wolf out there that would just love to eat you? How do you protect yourself? In the case of the Harlan's ground sloth, they evolved dermal ossicles. And the dermal ossicle is just what it sounds like, dermal skin, ossicle, bone. So they got these pieces of bone, they are, they're kind of trapezoidal, about this big around, that are embedded in their hide all the way from the base of their skull to their tail, all the way from their spine around to their belly. And if you're something like a giant short-faced bear and you try to eat one, you can end up breaking a tooth on one. It's almost like having a chain, like having a chain mail suit on. We've dug one of these things up in uh, Kings Valley between Monmouth and Corvallis where we were digging in sludge at the bottom of a, of a spring upwelling, and every bucket of stinking, nasty muck that we would bring up out of there, we would dump into a screen and screen it out, running water over the top of it, and every single bucket would have as many as 50 or 75 of these dermal ossicles in it. By the time we were done, we had literally hundreds and hundreds of, if not thousands, of these dermal ossicles. Uh, pretty neat to have it on there. The other thing that they had was this. And this is out of the Amhill River, a few miles from here again. What does it look like? Tooth. Well, it kind of looks like a tooth, but what it actually is is a finger bone. So if you look at your right hand, no finger, 
last phalanx right there, number three, this one right here, and you feel your own, it's this little tiny spade sheet thing about this big. If you're a sloth, it looks like this. Here's the pad. He'd have meat over the top of it, and then you get to the claw. The claw's made out of chitin, and chitin doesn't uh, uh, preserve well. It doesn't fossilize well. But if it did, you'd see that he had a claw that would go from here to about here. So giant ground sloths, not being very smart and not being very fast, grew really big with nasty claws and an armored hide. About the only way they must have tasted really good to have to go through all that just to keep from getting eaten. But that's what a sloth did. Then they looked about like this. Do you know they found a sloth at uh, in Dayton? Anybody here from Dayton? You can put your hand up. You don't have to be ashamed. Mm -hmm. it's, it's okay. No, I'm not ashamed at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, they found a sloth in Dayton. You know Palmer Creek? Yeah. About uh, 400 yards up, up uh, Palmer Creek in 1962. I think it was. They found a sloth in uh, in the creek there. They collected all the bones. They put him in a they put him in a barn. While they were deciding what to do with it, we had the Columbus Day storm, and the barn was blown over, and the fossil bones were never found. They may have been destroyed. They may have been lost. They may have been stolen. But uh, if you're from Dayton and you have an interest in uh, in that. They have found mastodon bones, a mastodon skeleton. Actually, Joel Palmer himself found a mastodon uh, skeleton in Palmer Creek and uh, the sloth. So if you're interested in that, www.willamettevalleypleistocene.com, contact me. I would love to have a contact in, in uh, Dayton and see what more we could find out about the history in Dayton because I'd love to take a look at some of that area. The Harlan's ground sloth. That's a claw out of one of them. And that's a tooth. They got really strange peg-like teeth. They're an edentate. Edentate means without enamel, and that means they got a really primitive peg-like teeth. Uh, the closest relative they'd have that would be anywhere close to them uh, would be like an anteater or an armadillo or something like that. But uh, the giant ground sloths evolved in South America. <laughs> They migrated up to North America, and they went all the way to Alaska, but not quite across the Bering Sea land bridge, and then they became extinct at the end of the Ice Ages. So, a trip down the Ambiel River in search of Ice Age megafauna. We should probably not um, take all day to do this, so I'm going to try and jump through this a little bit so I can answer questions and you can get a chance to come up and hold the fossils that we've got here. But let's take a couple of kids. I think you've seen them already. These are a couple of 4-H kids, as a matter of fact, and they went down the river. Um, year before last in our little boat looking for Ice Age fossils. When you do that, this is the Amhill River. Uh, most of the people I've grown up having folks say, oh, that dirty old river, oh, that dirty old river, oh, that dirty old river. I've loved it. I've lived on that river my whole life. This is, this is typical Yamhill River. You look for banks like the one on the right over here, which is a cut bank that might have fossils in it. You search the river. You wade it, you look carefully for anything that may have washed out of the bank. You find gravel bars like this, you pick through it and look for fossils. And if you have a keen eye, if you're really good, you'll find a little piece of bone like that. And every piece of bone, no matter how small it is, gets a number, a tag, a GPS number, photograph entered into the database because if you start following all of those, we have 40 years of data now, believe it or not. 40 years of data on where little things like this were found and you can actually follow them upstream. And if you're lucky enough, what you're going to find is the Amhill River, a hypothetical section of the Amhill River, in the summer gets these gravel bars on it. And if you're real lucky, you find a fossil like that, and then you get hooked like I did. And you look some more and some more and some more and some more, and the first thing you know, you got a bunch of fossils along the river, but you start noticing that they're in collected areas. So you haul out your scuba gear, and you go look for some more. And you end up saying, well, gee, now they're really in one area. And then you look for an area like this where you find them in situ, either wearing out of a bank or up a, up a creek. We found them both ways on the uh, Yan Hill River. All it takes is 40 years of practice, and you uh, start finding stuff like this. So see the fossil? Nobody sees the fossil. See the fossil. That's a bank of the Yamhill River. There's a fossil. 
and you start to carefully excavate it until you can excavate it from an inside you bank. An inside you bank just means that this is where the fossil came from. That fossil was deposited there, and it isn't just rolling down the river like that little piece of uh, bone that you saw that this kid found earlier. And when you get it all out of there, you take it back, preserve it, look at it, and study it. This held up against other fossils that we've already found, turns out to be part of the left scapula of a Columbia mammoth. Kind of cool. And in fact, we can look at this even more. And this has got a laser pointer on it, doesn't it? Let's see, is that the middle one? Yeah. <laughs> see this right here? That's a hole in the bone. It is a low-speed compression puncture of this bone. See the shape of it? That's the same shape as a dire wolf tooth. See the teeth marks across here and the chew marks here? Cool. You take a look over here, you'll see a wolf skull off of the Amhill River and a bison femur off of the Amhill River. And if you hold the wolf carnassial teeth up to the end of the bison bone, you'll see that the carnassial teeth exactly match the gnaw marks in the bison femur. So, just looking at the bones is called if is called ethnology. That is looking at a bone and telling what happened to that bone upon the animal's death and thereafter. We can say that maybe this animal here was not killed by wolves. It takes a lot of wolves to kill a mammoth, I'm sure, but he was at least scavenged by them, which is kind of a cool thing. Here's another one. See the see the fossil. If you're going down the bank, uh, I went by this one three, four years in a row. I thought it was a rock sticking out of the bank, but it turns out it's not a rock. When you get closer to it and look at it, huh, what in the world could that be? Start digging it out and it just gets bigger and bigger as you go into the bank, and you end up with this. That's a rib off of a Colombian mammoth. And again, you can tell really cool stuff from this rib. See that across here? That's a break in the bone that has healed. And those and this and this are arthritic scars. And you put all that together with the size of this very old mammoth bone and you come up with an inevitable conclusion. This is a female mammoth, not of very large size, that has a break in a rib which did not result in the animal's death. Almost undoubtedly, then, this is a mating injury because like in, mam uh, like in elephants today, there is sexual dimorphism in mammoths. The male is a lot, the bull mammoth is a lot bigger than the cow mammoth and oftentimes with African elephants, with elephants, modern elephants of today, in the course of a bull covering a cow, the cow ends up with breakage identical to this. The simple fact is, when you're as big as an elephant, if you fall down hard enough to break ribs on one side of your body, usually you don't get back up. That's usually a catastrophic type injury. So if you got one that's readily healed on it, if we extrapolate this bone to the modern day and look at it, again, it's ethnology. It's, it's, uh, it's the ability to look at a bone and say, what caused this animal to be the way this animal is. It's kind of a fun thing to do. If you look at it long enough, it will talk to you. Finding an inside to fossil location can lead to a detailed site excavation. This is the McMinnville Mammoth site where the tusk and most of the bones from the McMinnville Mammoth came out of and we've been excavating it for a number of years. There'll be a number of years in between where we can't excavate it because frankly it takes a whole bunch of uh, volunteer time, volunteer effort to, uh, to open a site up like this one and get it working. This is Chemeketa Community College in there right now. We've had Chemeketa Community College, Portland Community College, Linfield College, McMinnville High School, um, Woodburn High School. We've had a lot of different institu uh, educational institutions in here. And that can lead to local stu students making an amazing discovery. This is the McMinnville High School class, Mac High. Anybody here from McMinnville? Come on, Ken, raise your hand back there. Mac High Grizzlies, right? right. Yeah. This is your kids here, yeah. and this is a really hot day. And 
do high school students work very hard when you've worked them really hard and it's a really hot day again? Not usually. Not usually. So if you look at this girl right here, she's having a lazy moment. And she's starting, just starting, mind you, to instead of scratching the surface real carefully like she's supposed to be doing, she's just starting to find that this area right here is a lot softer and easier to dig in than the other areas. And she's going to dig that out. And this kid right here is going to find the same thing right here. And this kid right here is going to find the same thing right here. And then stupid old Mike is going to come along, look over the top of these three kids, and see this. And say, hey kids, those are mammoth tracks. You're excavating mammoth tracks right here in the old McMinnville. First time mammoth tracks have ever been found in McMinnville. And you guys did it. And we put it together. Can you see, if you look real carefully, you can see the track right here. This is forward throw. This is the squeeze. I just, you, you, we all played in mud. You step in mud and it squeezes mud up around the front of your foot and up between your toes. That's what you're looking at right here. And if you look at this, you can see a toe here, a toe here, a toe here. This is a mammoth footprint right out of McMinnville. This is pretty grainy soil, so it isn't a perfect footprint. You gotta have several of them before you can say, oh yeah, unquestionably this is a mammoth footprint. And those footprints have all got to line up just like a mammoth would walk. So we did all of that. And let's look at a modern elephant track. This is a modern elephant track out of Africa. Uh, you can see by the way of scale, you can see the fella's footprint in the, or foot in the upper stage of it. There's a modern elephant track. And here's a track off of the Yamhill River. This elephant here, this is his front foot. This is his back foot. He's traveling in this direction. And here's where he scuffed his toe as he was bringing it up out. So a man, an uh, elephant, will usually step on part of the front foot track with his rear foot when he is just walking. If they're running, they stretch out a little bit. But if they're just walking, it looks like this. And here it is on the Yam Hill River. Now, through the magic of uh, Adobe Photoshop, let's lay one on top of the other at exactly the same scale. Kind of convincing, isn't it? And we've got a full track line of them right across our site. The cool thing about it was, about the time we got to looking at that and finally started figuring out what we were dealing with, uh, we also found that there were ground sloth tracks and bison tracks in the same area. The area that we're digging this mammal, or uh, this mastodon, excuse me, this mammoth up was apparently a riverbank where the animals came down to water, and we've got a whole series of tracks down there. And fortunately, we've also had a huge bank slide right on top of the place, so it awaits maybe even another generation, but at least a lot of volunteer work and some funding before we can get back down and actually do a good study on these. We developed these tracks the last week of our excavating season out there, so we didn't have a lot of time into it. But again, it was one of the coolest things that we've come up with. Oregon State University has acknowledged our find of mammoth tracks in their museum, or excuse me, University of Oregon, in uh, the Condon Museum, and has a large map up on the wall of uh, different fossil finds in Oregon. And if you go to McMinnville, you're going to see a picture of a mammoth there with the caption mammoth tracks underneath it. And almost everything that was done was done by our area students and uh, the help of the volunteers around the area. So if you're interested in it, this is where we're at, or type anything you want in there, or get rid of, or get a hold of, rather, get in contact with Mean Susan over there, my sister. That was great <laughs> Susan. That's Mean Susan, my sister, right there, or Dorothy, my mother, right there. Great, great Henry. Yeah! Oh, wait a minute. Dorothy. If I can answer questions, I'll stick around as long as you want. If, uh, you want to come up and take a look at the bones, please feel free to do so. Handle them carefully because 
I know they've been around for uh, nearly as long as I have, so they're fragile. And I'll answer any questions for you. I'll stick around as long as you want or take off whenever. Thank you very much. Appreciate thank, it. Thank you, Mike. Myself, I, I really uh, think we owe you an, a mammoth applause. <laughs> question for you. Yes, How do you know what year or approximately what year some of these animals you pictured went extinct? Uh, there's been a whole lot of study worldwide in uh, the extinction event at the end of the ice ages and because of that and because some areas have just literally hundreds and thousands of these fossils they're able to radiocarbon date them. So they will take a radiocarbon, for instance, here. Uh, this bison femur right here was part of a master's thesis on the extinction event. And if you look at the back of it, we allowed him to take a small square of material out of there. He sent it off to a radiocarbon dating facility, and they came back with, a, uh, with an age of in excess of 51,700 years ago. So obviously this animal lived long before the extinction event and you keep doing radiocarbon, radiocarbon, radiocarbon until you build up this really long base or really huge base of all of the radiocarbon uh, dates and they go along like this. Yeah. That's the extinction event. And the, the animals went extinct over a period of just uh, just a couple of thousand years, uh, and that's that's the blink of an eye geologically. There's been there's been a theory that uh, they were overhunted. There's been a theory that the climate changed and they couldn't cope. Well, there were a lot of ice ages, several ice ages, and these same animals all weathered all of these ice ages. Some of them more extensive than the last, and they always bounced back. The only real difference between the last ice age where they all went extinct and the previous ones was in the last ice age where they all went extinct, uh, the, Bering, the, the Bering Sea land bridge opened up and there's evidence that a super predator invaded North America and that would have been us. And the extinction event seems, and this isn't, this isn't proven, it's still theory, the extinction event seems to have started up around Alaska somewhere and progressed south at about 12 miles a year. And anthropologists say that hunter-gatherer societies move approximately 12 miles a year in order to sustain themselves because they wipe out all the, the game for six miles in every direction, and then they pack up and move. Well, it seems like there's a pretty, pretty solid correlation between the extinction event and uh, 12 mile per year migration of humans from um, Alaska all the way to Monte Verde in the southern part of South America. Yes, ma'am. How, how do you get the, the thing so shiny and polished looking? Um, most of these, uh, particularly dental material like teeth and tusks, if you find them in the water and you take them out and you set them out home and you call somebody up and say, come look and see what I found, within a day or two, they're going to start falling apart for you. They're gonna crack and exfoliate and fall apart. So what we do is take a water-based polyurethane, we'll take one of, uh, we'll take something like a tooth and put it in a Ziploc bag with a little bit of water in it so that it's 100% saturated and it will put a pinhole in it. And we will let the water leave this so slowly that it does not, that, that it dries at about the same uh, amount inside and out so that the outside of it doesn't crack, split, and fall apart. And when we figure we have it just about right, and this takes a lot of years of trying, believe me, um, then we'll start saturating it with a, with a water-based polyurethane. And we thin the water-based polyurethane down to where it will displace water inside the fossil. And if we do it slowly enough, if we do it carefully enough, we'll get a, a fossil that has kind of a little bit of shine to it, but is, uh, it is, it's been cleaned, it's nice, it's clean and stable. Now some of the other bones, this one has only one coat of polyurethane on it. 
and that's because it had suspected butcher marks on it. And we wanted to send it off to uh, a BLM scientist in Utah that specializes in butcher marks to see if they were or not. The results were inconclusive, unfortunately. We didn't want to touch the bone until we knew for sure, so we sent it off in a baggie of water, and it came back in a baggie of water, and then we dried it and put one coat of polyurethane on it. If they're scientific, everything that we find, we look for butcher marks on, uh, we look for teeth marks on, we, we look to, for, to see what we can get, what information we can glean from it first before we do any preservation on it, because we do not want preservation work to hide or cover up or mask scientific data. But what you're looking at is a little bit of a shine because it has some polyurethane embedded in it. One more question. Yes, ma'am. Why do you find more pieces in the water than elsewhere? Because that's where they are. Um, easily put, if, if you were lucky enough, you could take a shovel, walk out the door right there and start digging. And by the time you got down to about 15 feet, 20 feet around here, you might be finding the end of the Ice Age. And once you found the end of the Ice Age, you might, if you're really lucky, uh, find a bone. Or you can go down the river because every time the river floods, it does a lot of the work for you. And we just go down and we look at these gravel bars and we scour them. And if we start finding pieces, we'll mark every single one of those on the map. We'll come back next year and do it again. And if we do find an area that there's pieces concentrated on, we bring the scuba gear out and we will scuba dive inch by inch a half a mile of the river looking for these things. It's something to do. It keeps us out of trouble. Every once in a while, somebody takes pity on me and comes along with me and brings a short case of beer, and life's good. <laughs> questions? I must have done a darn good job if I only had two questions out of the entire group. Come up, take a look at it, and ask me anything you want. Uh, you, can, you can get a feel for it. Anybody, has anybody here found fossils on, in the area on the Ant Hill? What have you found? Bison bone that I came out and had UID for me. Oh, oh, oh sure, Bill. sure, sure, sure. <laughs> yep. And, uh, and I'm still mad at you about that. So <laughs> we're uh, we've gotten oh let's see three more folks lately. A uh, kid from the Anhill River, or a kid from here in Midville rather, was playing on the Anhill River, 200 yards from my house, from my house, and came up with the most beautiful axis vertebra on a mammoth you ever saw in your life. About this big, 200 yards from my. How? Do you call that poaching? <laughs> That's poaching, isn't it? That's poaching. Uh, okay, anything I can do for you, I'll stay as long as you want to. Otherwise, thank you kindly. Oh, yeah. Uh, we helped them with uh, stabilization, and actually, they're coming in. And, oh, one of the things that I uh, did hit is so we do a lot of. Uh, uh, Making molds and casting replicas, and we've done molds and replicas for uh, university workers, uh, colleges. Have you been to the Dallas in Kowalski? Yes. Seen fossils there? Uh, in the back room, you know, going to the aquarium. Remember the aquarium? It's got a giant enormous. Huh? Yeah, we've only been in once. We don't remember. All the fossils, all the fossils are on display in there. We meet. All well, uh, thank you very much. Support his organization. We're fellow uh, history organizations, albeit uh, separated by uh, tens of thousands of years. But uh, just one tens of thousands of years. <laughs> I'm going to declare meeting adjourned. Just want to remind you, country dancing April 23rd. The next general meeting is on a Tuesday, May 9 at 6 p.m. That's the Volunteer Appreciation Day. And then Father's Day, June 18, 1 to 4. So uh, feel free to come up and check out everything. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you very much. That was very interesting. It was. Thank you.
Thank you.